Good morning. Oh, wonderful to see everybody this day. All kinds of things going on, so we're going to keep moving. Um, I was told, cut my sermon in half and, half and you'd all be happy. I'm going to make you unhappy because I'm not cutting it in half. Okay. Special welcome to Maisie Margaret um, Wells today, baptism. This is going to be our first baptism back in the building. We've had, uh, w- had wedding yesterday, first one back in the building. Uh, so a lot of firsts are happening since this last uh, winter, but uh, Maisie, you've got that special distinction of being the first, and uh, we're glad then that our, uh, the family members are also able to be here this day. Uh, let's see, voters' assembly meeting, which will be taking place immediately after this service, and how we're going to do that is uh, Bryce is not going to play a postlude, so at the end of the service, if you're staying for the voters' meeting, stay put. If you're going to be leaving, get up and go. Uh, Pastor Dan and I, we're going to get up, we're going to change, get out of our robes so we can come back in for the voters' meeting, uh, which will be taking place here and downstairs. How that will work, uh, the overflow, there's overflow down there right now, apparently. Uh, so if those of you who leave, if there's an empty spot or two downstairs, uh, the host will let you know that we got room for two, three, or four folks. Uh, those of you, if you'd like to come up for the voters' meeting, you can do that. Secondly, communion curbside. This will be the second time. I don't know if you saw some of the pictures. Kind of cool. Uh, we did two weeks ago our first curbside communion, and we had uh, 43 different individuals uh, that were here. I mean, you're talking singles kind of thing. And coming in cars, we were backed up around the corner onto the, onto the road. Uh, so it was uh, very wonderful and thankful. We're going to be doing that again this Wednesday, whatever the Wednesday following a normal communion service which is first and third Sunday. So 11 to 12, curbside, you can pass the word among uh, friends, family members, that uh, if they'd like to come, get in line, and Pastor Dan and I will be out there for distribution. LWML Fall Rally, Saturday, October 3rd. Book Club, uh, your books are at, available at the pickup. And something we, we don't normally do, but TJ Maxx right down here in Knollwood, they called. They're desperate for workers. So people are saying they're looking for work. TJ Maxx said they'll take anything, full-time, part-time, and whatever. So we don't normally do that, but uh, nonetheless, if you're looking for work, there's some jobs available right here in our area. Uh, Let's see. I think that's enough. You got some else? No? Okay. Let's stand, wave to one another, and begin our worship. And while we're still in a waving mood, I've been asked for us to turn around and wave at all the people who are with us remotely. So wave at the camera right there between the two screens. There we go. That'll make some people happy at home. (laughs) Because, of course, that's their way of being here with us. And if you turn around, they can kind of see you. If they can recognize you from your nose up, they can kind of see you and and be a little bit more uh, engaged with us. So we're happy to have everyone here, no matter where you're coming from. Let's begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our responsive opening. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. Is this your sincere confession? I am sorry for all my sins, and I ask for grace that I may do better. Amen. As you believe, so let it be. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The congregation may be seated as we hear our first song. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in 
Let's have the baptismal party follow me over to the font, please. Can we just move this temporarily? Thank you. Maisie gets front and center here. There we go. Come on over, little Sam. You can join him. Okay. Special time. Uh, this family especially was trying to debate what to wear today, but knowing this particular family, I had this. Uh, uh, over there, okay. We got a lot of Wisconsin folks, but I'm not going to. Okay, Gene is giving me the okay, don't wear it. Okay. Uh, the, parents, godparents, grandparents are going to be speaking basically on behalf of the congregation since we don't have hymnals in the pews, but we'll be following the order of baptism, page 268 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful, and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I ask the parents of Maisie, who brings this child to be baptized? If so, answer, we do. Please state her full name. Maisie Margaret Wells. Maisie Margaret Wells. Receive the sign of the cross, both over your forehead and over your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Continuing in the middle of page 269. From ancient times, the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors or godparents for baptismal candidates and catechumens. In the evangelical Lutheran church, like Zion, sponsors are to join with the parents and congregation to confess the faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed, taught in the small catechism. They are, whenever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. They are to pray for them, support them in their ongoing instruction and nurture in the Christian faith. And as much as lies in them, give their counsel and aid, especially if she should lose her parents. Sponsors, godparents, are to encourage the baptismal candidate toward the faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. Sponsors are at all times to be examples to them of the holy life of faith in Christ and love for the neighbor that the child may grow up to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. You've been asked to serve as sponsors on behalf of Maisie, and therefore I ask you, is it your intention to serve Maisie as sponsors in the Christian faith? If so, answer yes with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. May God enable you both to will and do this faithful and loving work, and with his grace fulfill what we are unable to do. Amen. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus to have them touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll share together, congregation joining in on the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve your coming in and your going out from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Because this child cannot answer for herself, we shall all together as brothers and sisters in Christ, together with sponsors and parents, faithfully speak on her behalf in testimony of the forgiveness of sin and the birth of the life of faith which God our Father bestows in and through baptisms. The questions I address to Maisie, we will answer on her behalf. Maisie, do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Yes, I believe. Maisie's ready, isn't she? <laughs> Enough talk, she says. Let's get to this. Okay, Maisie, let's have Dad hold you right over the center of the baptismal font. Maisie, Margaret Wells, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it is warm water. <laughs> okay. And we'll leave her with a baptismal napkin made by some of our members as a special gift and remembrance of this special day for her. Maisie, may the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with His grace to life everlasting. Amen. We have a custom here at Zion of presenting a baptismal candle. Take, go up and light it from that, please. And the idea is on the anniversary of today, which by the way, this is my youngest daughter's baptismal birthday as well. She's 37, so we got a ways to go. But the idea is on the anniversary of this is to light it and remind her of the fact that she is somebody very special, part of God's family through baptism and especially through Jesus who is identified often as the light of the world. One of our elders representing the congregation will at the black sheep hold that. Inside joke. <laughs> receive this burning light, Maisie, to show that you have received Christ who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which shall have no end. And then together, on behalf of the congregation, we speak to Maisie. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We receive you in Jesus' name as our sister in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you have graciously preserved and enlarged your family and have granted Maisie Margaret the new birth and holy baptism, made her a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as she has now become your child, you would keep her in her baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, she may faithfully grow to lead a godly life, to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. Let me give you these various things. We've got the baptismal certificate. We have a packet which is... Uh, 
uh, a nursery rule. We normally pass these out throughout the year, but you're getting everything at once. And the idea, these are some parental aids to help in Maisie's growth. And then uh, some letters to the godparents and the parents. Make sure you guys sign this later. Okay, Rachel. And just, uh, you guys can blow the candle out, return to your seats, and let you know that we have the handbell uh, ensemble going to be playing today. Both Sam and Rachel are part of that group, and this is their first time back, but they're playing. We wanted to do it in a special time for Maisie. So in honor of that, thank you guys. Do a good job up there, okay? <laughs> and since we've already done the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, when we come to that part in the service, we can uh, uh, proceed without that. Okay, with that, you can return to your place. Pastor Schultz, we're ready to continue. Moving to our readings for the day, our Old Testament reading coming from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Move on to our epistle reading, Paul to the Philippians, chapter 1 and various verses. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by my death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in the one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Will the congregation please stand for a reading which comes from St. Matthew chapter 20. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like the master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others still standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. 
And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired came first, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to every one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Here ends our gospel reading. Please be seated now for our song of the day. Playing the comparison game. We're actually pretty, pretty good at that. 
a company chartered a ship for its top salespeople as a bonus for good work done for successful sales. And these salespeople, they, they swarmed around and, and they loved where they saw on the boat. They headed for their individual cabins. Minutes later, though, one of these salespersons, they were on deck demanding to see the captain. One of the officers asked if he could be of help. My friend, have a much better cabin than I do, said the salesman unhappily. I did a good job this last year, just like he did. And I want a cabin just like his. Sir, the officers replied, the cabins are all identical. Yeah, said the man, but his cabin looks out on the ocean and my cabin looks out on this old dock. Some of you get that? They didn't get that last night. I thought it was a good beginning to the introduction. Now, soon they'll all be out on the ocean. All views will be the same. That's the punchline to that whole story. But it kind of brings up the question of this comparison thing. Have you ever noticed that we are perfectly content with what we have until what? We start comparing what we have with what somebody else has. It's hard not to compare what we have with what our neighbor has, hasn't it? Well, Gilbert Brim, he wrote a book. It's actually a pretty heavy-duty book. Simple title of Ambition. He tells about a man who sold his business for $10 million. Yeah! And he moved to Florida to start a new lifestyle. He was feeling pretty good about his success. Once he got to Florida, settled into his expensive home in an expensive neighborhood, he ran into a group of folks even wealthier than he was. And they had private plane safaris to Kenya. They had homes in Nassau, and they had a whole bunch more. Now, this rich fellow was completely happy until he compared what he had with what his new and wealthier neighbors had. He said he would have been happier if he had never moved to the Gold Coast. <laughs> now, you and I kind of shake our head and said, hey, buddy, come on. We would be deliriously happy if someone gave me $10 million, and many of us would be, until we ran into the person who has $50 million, right? It's pretty darn hard to avoid this comparison trap. Every one of us have that, that pull in our lives. You ever been to a high school or college class reunion lately? This last fall, I was at the 50th class reunion of our first football team, Concordia University in St. Paul. And it was interesting, I haven't seen many of these guys in over 50 years. You know, it's amazing how old they got. <laughs> yeah. uh, it can be especially dangerous for folks who try to find their own self-worth in comparing themselves to others. It's those who were happy, it turns out, and successful in high school, college, and uh, so on, the Brim, the author of this book said, they're the ones who go to the reunions, you know, the class presidents, team captains, the cheerleaders, the prom queens, and so on. The unpopular misfits who later become successful, perhaps, rarely go back, he observed, because it's too painful for them to remember their earlier failures. Comparing. Sometimes this comparison game happens in families. I know, not yours, and surely not in, in Maisie's family. No. Yeah. But the DiMaggio families, you recognize these guys? Recognize, you know the name, Joe DiMaggio, or many of you do anyway. He was a phenomenal baseball player in the 1940s and 1950s. He was a true American hero. Well, when he died a few years back, a Boston Globe photo, 1986, that's this picture, shows the DiMaggio brothers Quite honestly, I didn't know he had any brothers. I've, I've heard of Joe all the time, but two other brothers who also played baseball, I didn't know that. But their names were Vince, Dom, and Joe. They posed prior to an old-timers game at Fenway Park. Well, Vince, one of the brothers there, he reportedly said, I guess no matter what I do or how successful I am in baseball, I will always be under Joe's shadow. Now, Vince apparently was a fine player himself. I never heard of him, but apparently he was a good player himself. But he was not Joe. Anybody relate to that? Maybe. Maybe anybody in this room compared yourself to another and later regretted doing so? Yeah. 
Some sad, sad, sad stories can be told. Kirk, Kirk Webster is a guy I came across. And uh, he told about a couple who finally moved into their dream home in the Burbs. They moved out of the problem area where they lived, and they moved into the suburbs. And man, were they thrilled. Some sad, sad, sad stories can be told. They moved into this new place in the Burbs, and then they talked endlessly that at last they would be living the ritzy part of town neighborhood. Well, the wife apparently was so worried about fitting in, fitting in with the people of that ritzy neighborhood in her mind, she had plastic surgery done prior to the move. You know, she wanted to look right. Well, the surgery apparently didn't go so well, and she contracted an infection. In fact, the infection got so nasty, she had to take heavy-duty medication to stop her blood loss. It was the only way she could heal because the infection had, had gotten so widespread throughout her body. Eventually, she lost all of her fingers and all of her toes as a brutal side effect to the loss of blood flow to these extremities. All because, all because she worried about not fitting into her new surroundings. Well, the, the sad conclusion to this true story is a comment that one of her new neighbors made several years after the incident. When retelling the details, this neighbor made a stunning conclusion. The neighbor said, the terrible thing is, we're not a ritzy neighborhood. We're not a ritzy neighborhood. We're just a bunch of regular folks. Oh, that's sad. That's sad. You know, Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers to work in his vineyard, his grape, grape vines. And when, when uh, he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, that was the going rate, whatever it was, and that's for 12 hours work, that's, you got paid a denarius, normally. So the, the boss, he sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, so about nine o'clock in the morning, he went back to the marketplace, and there were some guys standing around there. He said, hey, you want a job? Get in my vineyard, and I'll pay you what's right. And he did. But the story goes on. The landowner went back to the marketplace again about the sixth hour, so about noon, and then again about the ninth hour. It's about three in the afternoon. Did the same thing. When there was only one hour left, probably about five o'clock in the workday, the landowner went to the marketplace again, found some other men, said to them, hey guys, you, you want some work? Go work in my vineyard right now. It's Matthew 20, our lesson that was read earlier. Well, why this is elaborated on so much by, in Jesus' story is scholars tell us, to understand the background, in Israel, the grape ripened toward the end of September, right about now. And after that, the rains begin to fall in Israel. And if the harvest is not gathered in quickly, what happens to those grapes? Ruined, and the guy's livelihood is in disastrous shape. So any worker that the landowner can get hold of is welcome, even if he can only do an hour's worth of work. And so Jesus concludes the story read earlier. When evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour, about five o'clock in the evening, came first, and each received a denarius. Well, those who had come earliest of the day, about six in the morning, they came, what do you think they were thinking about? Hey, I put in 12 hours, this guy put in one hour, I'm gonna get more money. But, the story tells us, they also received each one a denarius. When they received it, they said, hey, thanks boss, appreciate the work. Uh-uh. It's not what they did, did they? They began to grumble against the landowner, saying, hey, guy, these last men, they've worked only one hour. You made them equal to us who have borne the, the scorching heat of the day. And what's the implied phrase that you and I might say today? It's not. Yeah, yeah. What did the landowner say? Hey, friend. No. Am I being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Are you envious because I 
am generous. Well, you know the answer to that one, don't you? The workers would have been perfectly happy if they had not played the comparison game. They compared what they were paid with what the others were paid, and then they were dissatisfied. So where do you think I'm going with this? It's true of many of us, isn't it? We have a phrase for it, don't we? Keeping up with the Joneses. What do you think? Can you find happiness by acquiring stuff? I know we a lot we try, don't we? I mean, if we could just have a nice car or a nicer house or maybe a European vacation like the Joneses have, then, then I would be happy. And of course, the question is, would you really? Would you really? I came across what I think is a great illustration of this dilemma, and I put myself and probably most of you in the same category. Gal, the writer's name is Maya Angelou. She wrote a book in which she told about her Aunt T. It's a true story. Aunt T is a woman who worked for 30 years as a maid and a live-in housekeeper for a very rich white couple in Bel Air, California. And apparently on Saturdays, that was her day off, she'd often cook pig's feet and greens and fried chicken. Mm-mm, the chicken sounds good. We grew up in where we, my first congregation I served was in North Louisiana, and we grew greens, and Elizabeth and I ate greens. It's not good. <laughs> but apparently, it was a pretty staple, and, and she did that on a regular basis. And she, she'd invite some of her friends over for the evening. You know, it sounded pretty good. Have, uh, remember now, she was a live-in, live-in housekeeper. That meant that her employers would see everything that she did. And on many a Saturday, the chauffeur and the other housekeeper and her husband, they'd, they'd come to eat and drink and dance and laugh, play cards in her little apartment. One night during the middle of the whist card game, her employers, the rich white couple, they knocked on the housekeeper's door. And they apologized profusely, disturbing her, for disturbing her. And then they got right to the point. Every Saturday night, they said, you know, we, we hear happy, joyful laughter coming from your quarters. And here we go. We want to be part of it. Would you please leave your door open just a bit, they asked, so that we not only hear the joy, but can see it and experience it and feel it. Wow. The warmth and happiness of their 14-room house and three cars and swimming pool and who knows how much money couldn't quite cut it, could it? Those things couldn't buy them happiness. Well, Maya Angelou concludes or says this, uh, this scene um, in her book, and the book's entitled Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. Here's what she said in her, in her book. I draw the picture of the wealthy couple standing in the darkened hallway, peering into a lighted room where black servants were lifting their voices in merriment and camaraderie. And I realize that living well is an art this is the part that I like best. It's an art which can be developed, she writes. I love that part. Of course, she goes on, you'll need the basic talents to build on it. So here we go. And this is part of the takeaway for you and me for today. They are a love of life, ability to take great pleasure from small offerings, and thirdly, assurance that the world owes you nothing, and that every gift is exactly that, a gift. I think that is a wise woman. I wonder if that's what Jesus meant when he concluded his parable today by saying, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Can you buy happiness? No, things are nice. I mean, I'd rather have things than not have things. That's fine. But I don't want to base my life and my happiness on whether I have this and how much and whether or not it's the same with you. You know, another misconception that, persons, that a person's worth can be measured by the size of his or her accomplishments. We're going to see it in a little bit on, uh, at noon. Vikings, Packers, all that, they're going to be playing. You're going to see these young, young dudes out there running around on the field. You know, you're talking 20 years old, making millions of dollars, athletically solid. Uh, and you think, wow, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, friends, I hope you can accomplish every worthwhile dream in your heart. I really do. But be assured, such accomplishments are not going to increase your essential worth. Those guys playing today, 
are not better or worse than anybody else. You know, there are people who, because of their limitations, many kinds of limitations, can't even hope to accomplish nearly as much as you or me. But that doesn't diminish their essential worth one bit. I came across a final story I want to share with you. It's about a, the rebel troops in the country of Colombia. This is, this is a true, maybe you've seen it in your readings of the stories. It's, it's not unusual, but it's reported that these rebel troops in Colombia they would often finance their war against the government by kidnapping prominent citizens and holding them for ransom. Remember reading those stories? Uh, there were 1,800, 1,800 reported kidnapping cases in Colombia in just one year. This is back in 1997. Well, Ed Leonard was one of those 1,800. Ed's company, Terramundo Drilling Company of Ontario, Canada, uh, they had drilling sites in Colombia where Ed was stationed, where he was taken hostage by a group of these armed rebels. For 105 days, 105 days, Ed was held in various camps in the Andes Mountains. And then on October 6, Ed Leonard came home. How did he gain his release? They didn't pay the ransom. They didn't send the money. Instead, someone offered to take his place. And you know who that someone was? Ed's boss. Norbert Reinhardt. Reinhardt is the owner of Terramundo Drilling. And when all other efforts failed to free Ed Leonard, Norbert Reinhardt offered himself as a hostage in Ed's place. Reinhardt himself was held hostage then, somewhere in the Andes Mountains until his release earlier that year. Now, if you were Ed Leonard, wouldn't you feel you must be worth something to your company? If your boss would trade his life for your own? You know where I'm leading, don't you? I hope you better, anyway. God has showed just how valuable we are to him when he traded his son's life for yours. Jesus came into our world to be captured and killed in our place. He became the hostage to sin. He did so willingly. And although he died a horrible death, he willingly did so to eliminate once and for all the consequence of our sin. He died with the sins of the world, your sins, mine, crushing him. He bore the punishment demanded. He became the hostage to sin. He did so willingly. He bore the punishment demanded in our place. That task was completed on the cross on which Jesus was nailed and died. He died with the sins of the world, your sins and mine, crushing him. He died with the demands of a just God for disobedience and a rebellion against God. And that task was completed where Jesus nailed and was died 2,000 years ago. And when that punishment was completed, what did Jesus do? Something that never had been accomplished before. He came back from the dead. You can't do that, but he did. He rose from death to prove that although sin, death, and the devil thought that they were in control of the world and our lives, they weren't. He is. God is in control of our world, my friends. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead proved that fact. Jesus broke the rules by conquering death, and he did it all for you and me. And because of that gift, we can now live as forgiven sons and daughters of God. God's gift to us all because of his love for us. How valuable are you? God's gift of Jesus should tell you. My friends, you and I don't have to prove our worth to our neighbors or to our families or to anybody else in the world. The boss, God, traded his life for ours. And that's an idea too deep for us to ever totally comprehend. But it's, a, it's saying nothing else to us. If it's not, it should be saying this. We are of infinite worth just as we are. So don't worry about the Joneses. <laughs> I guarantee they got worries of their own. Quit playing the comparison game. There's nothing in it but heartache and failure. There will always be someone who has more, can do more than you or me. So let's rejoice in this. The God of the universe loves us more than any of us can imagine. And cherish that gift and share it with somebody else. 
We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There it is. Thank you. Get thumbs up. So the, instead of passing the offering plate, obviously over the past six months, we've got the offering plate here. If you're downstairs, should be an offering plate down there as well. We're happy that you continue to give. We're happy that uh, you're able to continue to give to the technology needs. Uh, hopefully in another month or so, the technology that we've got, the ability that we've got to live stream, all those things will hopefully be paid off. So continued for, uh, thank you for your generosity there. Uh, continue to let you know because it's a very very good way to do it, a safe way to do it, to donate online. If you want to get online, links down at the bottom, quick links down at the bottom of the, the center page, our home page, donate online, takes you to a secure site where you can do once, you can do bi-weekly, whatever you want to do. So continue to do that, or you can bring it by the office as well. Now, last week I learned something. I didn't really know this, but apparently they listen to us when we talk. Once in a while, pastor asked you two different things last week. He said, first, let us know where you're worshiping from. We know that we're touching people around the country at least because we received emails, but let us know where you're worshiping from, where you're live streaming with us, and uh, so we can uh, pray for you and know that you're out there. And then the second thing he said was make sure that if you hear a sermon you think is worth sharing, that you do that, use social media to share it. And both of those things happened. We had an email from Melanie in El Paso, Texas, who said, we know you from a previous member who is down here with us at our church. And she said, give Zion Lutheran a shot. And they've been watching us now for months. So Melanie and your family, if you're out there, thank you for being with us. We're gonna include you in our prayers for, in just a moment. So I wanna continue that. If you're worshiping with us from somewhere other than right here in this room and you're not a member, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know how we're impacting your life in hopefully positive ways. With that, let's stand and continue with the prayers of the church. Now, dear Heavenly Father, we heard a wonderful message today about contentment, to not compare ourselves and if we're going to compare ourselves with anyone, we would compare ourselves with Jesus, knowing that he is the only perfect person that ever lived, knowing that we can't live up to that perfection, but also knowing that out of God's grace and his mercy, that his son came and did everything so that we needed to do nothing but love him, serve him, believe in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your gracious gift of love and sending your son to us having him live for us that perfect life which we could not, die for us in that terrible death that we would not want, and rising again, giving us that glorious life before we went to heaven, he went to heaven to prepare a place for us, and we look forward to that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the joys of life, for Maisie being made a part of your family formally and officially today with her family and extended family. So wonderful when we add new kids, new children, new people of God to our family of faith. The first baptism, as Pastor Neil said, since COVID hit yesterday, the Almond wedding, Craig Almond and Tina being married, the first wedding here in the building since COVID hit. So an, a lot of firsts, as we said, a lot of things may be returning to a semblance of normal. Hopefully the face masks won't continue forever, and hopefully we'll be able to sing someday soon in the sanctuary again. Hopefully we'll be able to fill the sanctuary again. We'll take things as they come and as we're able to do safely. We thank you so much for the times of life, the 95th birthday of Dee Lenander, the 90th birthday of Raleigh Milhalko, birthday of Dan Stover. Thank you for being with all those celebrations and milestones of life. Thank you, Jesus, for uh, celebrating and allowing us to celebrate those things because of what you did for us. We also ask you to be with those of us who need healing, strength, and so many different challenges of life. We pray for Chris Regario, Rob Wilson, Rick Shorten, Karen Doyweiler, Isabel Kloss, Linda Johnson, 
or Mike Volker, Brian McCutcheon, Jim Christensen, David Herzon, June Lundgren, Janet Denno, Fred Arntz, Marcus Bachman, Shirley Turhell, James Putnam, Anita Olson, Donna Schwartz. These folks we know of, Heavenly Father, but you know of so many more who need to know you more, who need to call on you for strength and mercy. Heavenly Father, be with all those we pray for, pray for in our hearts and in our minds as well. Heavenly Father, there are so many special things going on in the world, so many different places where we need your hand and your uh, love to show forth. So Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with all people that need to know you. We ask you to be with those who are feeling the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice who passed away last Friday, knowing that whether we agree with her, not agree with her decisions, that she did touch the lives of so many people and she will be missed. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our special members. This past week, Zion, uh, the staff here, we prayed for Heather Gray, for Bob and Christy Gray, for Gil Gruber, for Corinne Gust, and Marcy Gust. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for each and every family and member of Zion. We pray for Melanie and her family down in El Paso for that congregation. We thank you for those who watch wherever they're watching from that ask that you be powerful and work powerfully in their lives. And Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us in our voter meeting. It's happening just in a few minutes. We ask you to be with us as we're making decisions for the church, for our, our visioning for the number of years going forward, and help us make plans that are aligned with your plans. And Heavenly Father, thank you for the meal which we are about to share, remembering Christ's body and Christ's blood in this meal, having it be very real and present with us, and having it draw us in a faith relationship towards you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So those of you who have been worshiping with us since July, we've been offering communion here, doing it in a very safe way. As Pastor Neil says, we are the only ones in the entire world that have this kind of self-serve setup. So you'll notice the screen, there is a special tray for those of you who uh, cannot have alcohol, that have a uh, apple juice with a slight tincture of wine. That will be a tray that will be up here. Let me know if you need that. There are also four that have white dots on them, and that is the gluten-free. So once that's there, if you have a question, that's why I'm here to help. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Now the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
please rise. Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ indeed strengthen and preserve you to fight faith to life everlasting. Depart now in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gracious gift that you have once again refreshed us with. We ask that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We can be seated for our closing hymn. song to send us out with. Excellent. So there will be no postlude, as Pastor Neil said, right after the benediction. If you're not a member, you're not going to stay for the voters meeting, go ahead and head on out. Those of you who are going to stay for the voters meeting, I'll have you sit back down and wait while we go get everything ready uh, out there, and then we'll be back with more instructions in a little bit. Makes sense? Hopefully it makes sense. We'll see how well they listen. <laughs> 
Now may the Lord indeed bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.